Thank you. Uh, yeah, Ethereum. Uh, who's heard of Ethereum? Okay, a few of you. Good. Um, does anyone here roughly know what it is, how it works, how it compares? Yeah. Okay, not too many. Um, so. If the internet brought about um, the communication between uh, arbitrary people along the planet, then Ethereum kind of does the same thing, but it allows people to agree on stuff. So it's, uh, whereas with the internet, you can't really trust that what the person uh, is saying you across the, <laughs> across the globe is, you know, bears any resemblance to reality or what will happen in the future. With Ethereum, this, uh, this kind of um, allows you to do that. It allows you to have that certainty. So um, the thing that Ethereum sort of, what it is, I guess, is a, um, a decentralized singleton machine. So there's this notion that you have a, um, a single compute resource. Now, normally, this would be a server, i.e. it would be you know, a, a physically localized box sitting in a data center somewhere um, that uh, processes uh, computation. Now, of course, the problem is that the people who use that box, that compute resource, don't have access to it. They can't be sure that it's running the software that they think it's running. Um, they can't be sure that it won't be um, altered or corrupted or reinstalled or whatever down the line. But up until quite recently, that's all we've had to go on. We, we, we haven't had an, an alternative way of having a singleton compute resource that people can, can use and share and collaborate within. Um, that is uh, anything other than a single machine. And what uh, sort of Bitcoin kind of you know, showed us maybe how to do, and what Ethereum is sort of really building on, is uh, the notion of using the blockchain as a shared singleton, so as a decentralized singleton. And that's kind of a new thing in computer science. A lot of people don't kind of see this, including a lot of computer scientists, funnily enough. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a new way of doing it. And it has some you know, really important ramifications for society when you consider that um, when you localize something physically, it allows people to, um, uh, to have power over it and everything that goes on within it. So within this machine, we run, um, we run code, obviously. Um, and the idea is that within this, within this singular environment, the code can call into other code different people's code. They can all sort of interact and build an ecosystem of software. And the important thing is that it, it, can't, it can't escape the environment. It, it all has to stay within. It has to stay within because it must be fully deterministic. If it's not fully deterministic, then we break the notion of the blockchain. We can no longer be a singleton that's shared by everybody uh, that's run by consensus. And then the idea of the only way you can get into it from the outside, the only, uh, the only interface with the real world, with you know, with us, um, are transactions. So it's kind of like, you know, when you're doing your source code repository with Git and uh, you check something, and that's like a transaction. And then within Git, um, that's, that's, the, that's the current state. And the transactions come in and they can alter the current state. Well, it's the same sort of thing with this, except transactions have to be uh, cryptographically signed. So we have to be absolutely certain that they are from who they say they're from. Um, and of course, once they go in, they're archived so that people coming to the party late can see how the state got to where it is. So they can run through all the transactions from the very first state, the genesis state, and uh, get to what the system is supposed to be at right now. So yeah, it's, it's a, diffuse, a diffuse singleton. And this is kind of important. The idea of, of no authority, no localization, it's, it's a running theme with uh, with this, this technology. Um, so Bitcoin, uh, you know, it, it sort of, it jumped the gun slightly. I mean, as, as is want with new technologies, um, the application comes before the, the underlying platform. You know, the sort of calculator came along before the computer. Um, so Bitcoin, uh, an application of, of this idea of a diffuse, decentralized uh, singleton, um, came along um, uh, with the application attached to it. Uh, the application, of course, being a central, um, well, not a central clearinghouse, but a, a singleton clearinghouse. Um, it's often considered a currency. It has some of the attributes of currency, for sure, but it, its key thing is that it allows, um, it's a computational resource that allows people to exchange value 
um, from uh, one account to another account um, without um, with being absolutely guaranteed that there is no double spending going on and with a, uh, a ledger so they can see the, the history of, of all the transactions. And that's a clearinghouse. So a clearinghouse is actually a, a contract. It's a very simple contract. It just says, you know, you can't, you can't spend the same resource twice. Um, and uh, we want to keep, a, keep track of all the transactions so we know where we are. It's a very simple contract. So when we get to Ethereum, from Bitcoin, we can, we can say, right, well, rather than having a partic uh, this particular contract, this, this clearinghouse, we'll just say, well, let's have arbitrary contracts. Let's say, well, you know, we want to make our own rules up. Um, and uh, we want people to be able to interact with each other under this rule set uh, if they choose. And that's really the, that's, that's the sort of USP, the premise of, of Ethereum and of of crypto law um, as opposed to cryptocurrency in general. Um, so there we go. Uh, Ethereum is the Bitcoin. It's another one of my similes. I quite like my similes. Uh, Ethereum is the Bitcoin as the iPhone is the calculator. So calculator, one particular um, application. Um, Bitcoin's the same. So the Ethereum project, it's, you know, uh, it's under, I think it's under LGPL technically now, but LGPL, LGPL, MIT, it's, you know, it's free. Um, it's on GitHub, you can go and see it. Um, we've actually got three implementations. I did the C++ one, and then there's also a couple of others. Um, the C++ and the Go implementations are actually com completely uh, compatible. So they use the same blockchain, they, they transactions on one appear on the other. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like the same fundamental singleton, but of course you've got two different ways of viewing it. And um, f the fact that we haven't actually got a, um, you know, a main net going yet is kind of, uh, kind of cool that we've got two compatible implementations. Um, Bitcoin didn't manage that for a long time. And even still, um, a friend of mine, Amir, who's done one of the... Um, uh, one of the alternative Bitcoin implementations still, uh, well, you know, we run it, it's, it's still running, but, uh, you know, you can never be certain that it's exactly right. And the problem is, of course, that Bitcoin doesn't have a, um, a reference, uh, into, you know, um, a, a formal reference. Um, the reference for Bitcoin is a very kind of vague white paper and the client. <laughs> and uh, it, therefore, if you want to write another client, you've got to sort of guess which bits are implementation decisions, which bits are just uh, the actual interface. And it's not always clear. Um, so yeah, the state. What, what do I mean when I say this? So when I say state, how many people know what I'm talking about? How many people just think, what the fuck? OK. Most people? OK. Good. So uh, just in case, not everybody. Um, the state the state of a computer system is very well defined. It's kind of like, it comes from, you know, saying the state of the world. Well, the world is in a particular configuration at the moment. I'm standing here. You guys are sitting there. Um, it's, it's kind of like a snapshot of all the things that matter. That's the state. So in Ethereum, all the things that matter are actually just a bunch of accounts, a bit like in... Um, a bit like a bank, you know, a um, bunch of numbers, bunch of um, 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 other numbers next to them, I suppose. Um, and Ethereum accounts are a little bit more special than bank accounts. They, they do have a balance next to them, like a bank account. Um, they have an address similar to a, a, the number of a bank account. In this case, it's 160 bit. Um, uh, I think it's the, the right 160 bits of the uh, 256 bit public key. Of, uh, of a key pair, um, and they have a balance. They have, they have a thing called a nonce, which is basically just the number of transactions that has gone uh, come out of this particular account. Um, that's uh, I'll, no, I'll go into that later if somebody's interested, but I don't think it really matters for now. Um, it's got um, code and storage. These two are these two are more interesting. So normal address, normal accounts. Um, for a normal account in Ethereum, I create a key pair. So nobody knows this key pair apart from me. Um, when I say a key pair, who knows what I'm talking about? Who, who hasn't a clue? 
Okay, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Good. So I keep the secret. I give the public away. In fact, I just give the right one 60 bits from the public array. Um, that's the address. Um, and, and I don't bother with the code and the story. That doesn't matter. Um, I've, it's got a balance. And it works really similarly to a bank account. People can put, uh, make, you know, put money in from their account, and it goes into my account. Then, of course, I can sign transactions with the secret key and push that into the Ethereum system. And, and of course, uh, that allows me to spend my balance. But we also have, for some accounts, for what we call contract accounts, um, now these accounts provably have no secret key to go along with them, or at least there's, a, <laughs> there's an incredibly low probability that somebody has the secret key. Uh, the probability is like one in, if you take the number of atoms in the universe and divide it by a thousand, it's, one, it's the chance that this particular atom is one of those. It's very, very small. One in two to the 256. Um, and these contract accounts have an associated piece of code, um, uh, computer code. They also have an associated storage, data store. And those two components um, are all you need. I mean, basic CS. They're all you need to model a, a machine. So how do you alter the state of Ethereum? You uh, introduce transactions. Um, these transactions get recorded onto the blockchain in pretty much exactly the same way as Bitcoin, with a Bitcoin transaction. You want to spend some money, you make a transaction, you sign it with your secret key, and you, uh, and you push it out onto, the, onto the, the miners, the mining network, or you mine it yourself if you've got an incredible amount of compute power. And, um, and then, yeah, it's on, it, it alters the state, and it's recorded into the blockchain. So it's the same in Ethereum. The transactions do one of two things. They either um, what we call send a message call, so they, they um, object-oriented language, relatively similar to the notion of a message call. Um, in an object, if you were to um, make this, uh, apply the notion, the principles of object-oriented programming to this, you would say that the accounts are objects. And that when you send a message call, you, you literally send a message to that object. Um, so they can either send a message call. This, this allows you to, to transfer an amount from a balance to another account's balance. But it also, if the, if the, um, if the, uh, the account that you're sending the message to is a contract account, what it will do is it will run the code of that contract. I'll go into that a little bit later. The alternative thing that a transaction can do is it can create a contract. So you can actually push code onto the system and create these, these contracts, these, these autonomous um, agents of the system. So when you create a contract, you give it, some, uh, you give it a bit of money, some ether. Uh, so this is the, this is the sort of um, compute token of the, of the network. Um, you give it some initialization code. And you also you sign it, obviously. It's got a signature. You give it some uh, the gas. I'll go into that later. It's not massively important. But basically, this is to get around the halting problem. Before any computation is done, you specify up front a limit on the amount of computation that will be done for this transaction, and you pay for it. Pay for it with this, the, the, the ether. Right? So um, if you, well, you know, if you weren't to do that, then you just stick a wild true loop in there. It just, you know, go, the miners will be mining it forever. So you really need this, uh, this ability to, to limit the amount of, um, of computation that miners need to do. And uh, you tie it in with, with a payment mechanism, and it kind of works. So when you create a contract, you, the system, the effect of the transaction, is to place within the system a new account. Um, like I said before, the, the address of this account is something which provably doesn't have a secret key. And the code in the account is the, the re whatever the initialization code returns. So you run this initialization code um, in order to create the account. The, the, well, the code is run on the Ethereum network by the miners. Um, as the account is created, and whatever that code returns, like the return value, you get it to return an arbitrary um, uh, byte array, arbitrary length byte array. That's that's what, that is the code for the contract. Um, I'll go into that a little bit later. 
So with message calls going, transactions that, that just do messages, um, there they have a recipient in, in addition to the other things, the value that you want to pass, the, the, the value that you want to transfer, um, the data. Um, so this allows you to pass in arbitrary size um, byte arrays, so you can pass in arbitrary amounts of data. Uh, the gas, uh, the, this is the limit of computation that can be done, and of course you sign it. Um, when it's received, um, of course the value is transferred from the sender to the recipient, but also, very importantly, the code um, is, uh, if, it's, if it's a contract account, which is to say if it has code attached to that account, that runs. It runs, and it's passed the data in as well. So this allows you to do basically arbitrary message calls into the, into the system. Okay, so that's the basic overview. I'll go into um, what, what opcodes the virtual machine has within Ethereum now so you can get a feeling for uh, what's possible. Um, it's true and complete, so basically, you know, it's, it's reasonable to expect a C compiler in, I would hope three or four months we'll get a C compiler going. Hopefully, like with the, uh, the LLVM C lang system, but we'll see. Um, so it's got an arbitrary size stack, so you can, you know, do your stack, you've got your stack stuff. It's got the, the temporary memory, so this isn't storage, this is just sort of, you know, um, a, a, a volatile um, uh, non permanent um, memory. This gets reset every time uh, the machine is invoked. Um, and there's also this sort of, uh, the code cannot be changed. So it goes into a, a sort of virtual ROM, um, and that's where the code runs from. So that's, again, separate to the temporary memory. It's separate to the storage, and it's separate to the stack. It's, uh, it just runs from a, <clears throat> a separate store. Um, it's got, obviously, uh, arithmetic and logic operations, and it's got the SHA-3 as well, so you can do a bit of, uh, you can do hashing. And it's, it obviously, you know, it's got flow control. Um, now it can, this is, yeah, so the environment, it can, it's got the, uh, this idea of passing data into the, uh, through, the, through the transaction into the message. Um, so you've got a bunch of opcodes to, to read that data. Um, it can also return the uh, return output data, as I sort of alluded to before, with the initialization code returning the body of the uh, uh, the body code for the account, uh, and that's done with the, with the return um, opcode. It's also got a couple of others. Suicide allows you, surprisingly enough, to um, to destroy for the contract to destroy itself. A sort of if anyone speaks C it's a sort of delete this. Um, and yeah, we come to the storage. So the, the, these are the really these are the really cool ones. These are the these are the opcodes that you don't find anywhere else, right? So we've got storage, load, and store. So this is your this is your permanent um, storage. So this allows a, this allows an account to uh, place whatever data it wants and keep it around there for the next time it's invoked. So this, if it were say I don't know a, a, a Bitcoin like currency. Um, contract. This is where it will put all of the account balances. Okay? Um, it's a 2 to the 256 well, word addressable. When I say word, the word size of this machine is uh, 256 bit. So you can store an awful lot of, you know, effectively it's unlimited. Um, you have to pay for it though. <laughs> so you pay for it out of this gas, out of this computation limit that you specify up front. And very, very importantly, it can create new messages. So these aren't transactions because they're not stored on the blockchain. They don't need to be because it's all deterministic. And so once the transaction comes in from the outside world, everything else that happens, everyone can agree on anyway. So you don't need to store these into the blockchain. Um, that said, they behave in much the same way as, as the transaction. Um, so they, they invoke, they create a new instance of the virtual machine, and they invoke it um, according to the, uh, the account code that's, that's at the recipient's address. So um, other than that, they're the same as the transactions. They just don't get stored. And of course, they don't have a, um, a signature. There's no need for them to have a signature because they come, they're fully trusted because they're, they're coming from a running uh, invocation of the virtual machine. So you can be absolutely certain they're coming from the right, uh, the, they are faithfully being sent from that address. 
and you can create new contracts as well. So you can make message calls, but you can also create new contracts from within the running row of contracts. So, you know, in theory, you could have a, you know, a, a, a sort of DAO, a, a, a cab driving DAO. You know, this is this is a bit of a classic one that comes up quite often, where you've got a fleet of cars and they're all sort of driving people around, collecting fares, and they could, in theory, spawn off copies of themselves in different countries. You know, that, so it's it's quite important the idea that that it can create new um, new contracts. Um, you've also got a few other bits of the environment, so you can query things that are on the blockchain. You can find the timestamp of the most recent block. Uh, you can find the previous hash, uh, the number, and the the the, the miner's address there, the Coinbase. Um, and there are a few other bits of information. So, origin and caller. Caller is effectively a sort of this pointer. Um, it's it's the address of the current object, uh, the current account. Um, origin is the original, originally transacted account. It, you know, it's kind of technical, but no, it's a technical talk. Um, balance, obviously, the balance of the current account. Well, actually, I think you give it an operand, so it's a balance of any address that you want. And then the address is the um, the address of the current object. Ah, yeah. So that's the this pointer. Caller is the uh, uh, the object that's calling you, or the person if it's a transaction. So, as I've said before, um, all of the stuff that requires the miner to do anything at all costs, and you pay the miner to do that. So this, this, when I say it costs, it doesn't get burnt, it, it, it actually gets transferred to the miner's balance. Um, and it does so via this notion of gas. Gas is, it can be thought of effectively as a, just a multiplier on the F. So the idea is that, um, Rather than having a multiplier, you specify a new currency, and the currency is um, uh, is exchanged for the ether up front, and then it gets re-exchanged back again afterwards. But really, it's gas and ether are almost interchangeable. The only difference is that um, the exchange rate is per transaction, not global. So this allows different transactions to offer different payments um, for their um, for the computation that they need done. Some transactions offering, say, a lower exchange rate of ETH um, on gas would, uh, may get left behind by some miners that have relatively high compute costs. Other miners may have lower compute costs and therefore pick up the transactions that, that offer less, uh, less ETH per gas. So I said uh, the talk's actually called like programming uh, society with assembler, but I thought that would that was quite nice for the name of the conference. Actually, we don't we don't really use the uh, the assembler so much. Um, the lowest level language we tend to use is LLL, uh, the, the low level Lisp like language. Um, if does anyone here, as anyone here, when I say Lisp, does anyone here know what I'm talking about? Ah, very good. Okay. Uh, that's very good. Okay, so I don't need to uh, need to go into this too much. But the basic idea is that the um, uh, every opcode has an associated Lisp LLL um, 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 expression, um, and then you just put the operands after the expression in the parentheses. So um, if it's just a, a simple um, a simple literal, then we just push the literal on. But if it's a uh, if it's something else like the um, the M load there, then we we include an operand. We put them in uh, parentheses, and what it will do is it will push any literals and it does everything in the right way. It does what you expect. Okay, our first contract. This is a currency contract. This implements something like Bitcoin. Um, actually, it doesn't do any of the mining of Bitcoin. It's a pre-mined version of Bitcoin. So, what we do first is we can I have a pointer? Ah, there we are. Okay. So we pop into our storage, a very large number, um, at our address. This is the data for this contract. is is going to be super, super, super simple. The storage. Um, so everyone has an address, 160 bits. The storage can obviously store 256-bit uh, key-value pairs. So at our, we're just going to say, right, well, the value at the uh, when we use an address, um, a person's address as the as the key, 
the value at that at that point in storage will be their balance. So really super simple. So we're basically setting our balance to be whatever that is, like a trillion or something in hex. Very big. Um, and then we're going to, as I said before, we have to return from this initialization code, you have to return the body code of the contract. There's actually a really nice little um, thing we have here, return LLL. And all this does is it says, this expression that comes after me, that's what I want to be the code for the, for the, for the contract. Um, what we say is, well, when we've got two, um, two bits of data, when two bits of data has been passed, so that's uh, two times 32 bytes, or two 256-bit words. We will do the sequence of. Um, we'll, we'll load the balance of the caller, storage load, into address zero of memory. We will um, check to see if that's greater than the second of the two words passed. So what we're doing there is, um, asking if they have at least this in their balance, in the callers, the caller in their balance, according to us, have at least this amount, this, uh, uh, this second of the two data items amount, which you know is gonna be the value that we want to transfer. Then we go on and we say, right, well in that case, um, subtract um, that, uh, uh, the, the, the caller's um, balance. Um, oh, sorry. Take the um, take the value that we want to transfer, the second of the two words, and subtract that from the caller's balance. And that's what we're going to store as the new caller's balance. And then you know do the opposite with the um, with the first of the two words. So the first of the two words, of course, becomes the recipient of the balance. So the way that you use this contract is that you pass it in the, as the data, the recipient and the amount that you want to transfer to them. Actually, there's some um, advanced uh, uh, syntax for LLL. Uh, we can use a slightly nicer way of doing variables and a slightly um, more concise way of doing uh, memory and storage accesses. And, uh, and loading from the call data. So actually, we can express that program in something a bit smaller. Um, whether it's easier to read or not is perhaps a matter of opinion. But I, I like small things. So. Uh, so in this case, we're just uh, setting A to the caller's original balance, checking whether it's um, greater than the second of the two words passed in. If it is, then we store it as being um, the new the new caller's balance as being 32 uh, sorry the second word minus the original balance the original balance minus the second of the two words um, and similarly we put the uh, recipient that's the first of the two words dollar zero uh, we put in their place whatever it was plus the uh, the amount that we want to transfer to them okay and the way that we use it is we um, we, we say to the currency contract, I'm going to write you a transaction, write you a message. Um, I want to give you the, uh, this recipient, and you should transfer this to them. Uh, we also have um, variadic, for, for more advanced stuff, uh, variadic arithmetic and logic and macros. So you can do like C style macros as well, like hash defines. Um, relatively uh, straightforward. OK. Um, So, yeah, let me, let's do some real stuff now. Let's see if this actually works. Uh, oh, no, where did it go? Uh, ah, here it is. So this is the, this is the client for Ethereum. Over... Here, you can see the blockchain. There are 198 blocks in the blockchain. And um, here are some of the transactions that have been going on. Each block, let me take you to this block. 
each block has a hash, it tells you what the number is, when it was the timestamp, um, a bunch of stuff, children, difficulty, who mined it, um, uh, uh, the transactions that were involved in it. If we go to a transaction, we can see what was included with the transaction code. And we can also see what, how it changed the state. In this particular transaction, this added a contract. It added the config contract. It's got 41 bytes of code. And it also has a particular uh, address, uh, OX45. It has my address. Um, it stores my address for a reason. Um, it tends to store, contracts tend to store an address of, of the administrator. It seems to be a running sort of theme. It's so that they can remember if someone needs to kill the contract later on, they can check it against the caller and say, ah, yeah, this is the right guy who made me, I'll, I'll suicide now. Because other than that, there is no way of, of getting rid of a contract once it's on the system. It's its own thing. Um, it can only be interacted with with transactions, and therefore it, can, it will only do what it's program to do. If you don't include a suicide um, in strop op code in that transaction, in the, sorry, in that contract's body code, there is no way of getting rid of the contract from the system. It's, it's there forever. And uh, what it also does is give some of the balance to the miner. So this is a very simple, uh, I, uh, it cost this much to me, and the miner got this much from me. OK. So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to create a contract. Um, I'm going to create uh, this contract. No, not that contract. The contract I showed you. This contract. So um, caller, that's us, the, the people that make the, the, the account from which, which is creating this contract. Um, we're going to get we're going to get lots of uh, lots of money. So there we go. We're going to put in our address a nice big number. Now you can see it's compiling um, this program down here. So this is the assembler it's compiling to. Um, push whatever that is um, two to the thirty-two uh, caller. That's us. That's going to return our our address and then s store store that in memory. Okay. Um, then we're going to um, return some code. So we're going to use the return LLL. And what this will do is, is that LLL? No, it's two Ls. Um, then what we're going to do in here is have a sequence of things. And, uh, oh yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. The whole thing needs to be enclosed in curlies since it is a sequence of commands. There we go. And within here, we're going to let me refresh my memory. Ah, yes. So check, first check that there's two um, arguments. So when call data size, um, and make sure that is uh, greater than or equal to 64, then we want to do some stuff. Oh, when this is just parentheses, it's even harder to write. And we're going to set a. Let's actually do. Let's let's use nice names. So this is the um, uh, sending account, and we're going to put in there. Oops, uh, oh no, sending balance. We're going to put in there the um, whatever is in storage at the uh, the caller's uh, address. Okay, and then we're going to check to see if that's greater than what we um, what we think it should be. So when greater than or equal to uh, the sending balance, which we can get just by using that the at sign, and uh, when that is greater than or equal to the amount that we are supposed to be transferring, which is the second of the two arguments, then we will do something. Uh, 
I think that should have a parentheses on as well. Yeah, there we go. And then what do we want to do when we've checked that there's enough in their account to send? Then we just want to uh, subtract from the sender and add on to the recipient. So subtracting from the sender is as simple as storing in the caller's storage um, minus um, their original balance, which is sending balance, um, and then the amount that they want to send, $1.32. And then add, if we left it at this, <laughs> then of course it'd be a bit of a bug because you would send some money and it would go from your account, but it wouldn't go to the recipient's account. So we want to add on to the recipient's account um, that balance. So um, at dollar zero, which is where we're storing the, where we expect the recipient accounts, uh, uh, recipient's account address to be, uh, we're going to put um, plus uh, the uh, original thing at that address. At dollar zero with dollar thirty two. And there we go. That is our contract, relatively simple contract. And what we can do is we can uh, execute this. Actually, let's debug it. So, debug just allows us to run through it, see what, what will be executed. This is um, the debugger we have here is quite a nice one. Uh, as far as I know, it's the first example of a random access debugger, um, which is to say you can step through as you would expect, but you can also step backwards. Um, indeed, you can just um, step wherever you want. Um, in this case, we push a lot, we push my address, and we store. And as you can see, this is the storage. So at my address, there is this large number which we know to interpret as being, I've got a lot of money in my balance, in my, in my account. Um, and then we, we push the code, and it returns the code. That's the, that's the actual code for the, uh, that is the body of the contract. Uh, we can tell it's the code because it's got lots of 60s. 60 is push. So um, you can generally recognize um, uh, VM code quite easily. OK, so we'll execute that. And it goes on to the pending transactions. Now, we could mine it, but rather than mining, I'm just going to preview. Um, so we can preview what the world is like once that, once that block uh, is mined. Um, and if we want to check, we can just see, uh, see what this transaction is. There, there's its code that it's, it's got to run. Um, it's from me, and it creates a contract. The new contract is 047B5, da 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 da. Um, now, if we want, to, if we look in the contracts, there it is, 047B5, and we can see that at my address, it's got this value, which is to say I'm rich in my currency I've just invented. So I'm going to double-click this, which will copy this this contract address, and we're going to send this contract a message by popping it in there. The message we're going to send it is. I want to send from my oodles of, of cash um, to um, ooh, somebody else. Who else? My other account, let's say. Um, Gav Wood. I'm going to send Gav Wood. So I put in his address. And then I put in how much uh, I want to send, which is going to be 42 with a few zeros. Now, I'm going to debug this, because this is more interesting to see how it runs. And we can see the code running through. So push. Uh, this, uh, this is where we check whether it's, um, um, whether it's the right size of, of operands, whether it's the right size of data coming in. And uh, the two, uh, the, the way it works, it does less than, and then yeah, anyway, it, it's all fine. <laughs> Uh, this is the optimizer kicking in, so the code that you see isn't exactly as you um, might expect it. Um, then we load what's at my address. So um, this is the um, oodles of cash. And we're going to store this in memory. So there we go, M store in uh, zero. No, let's put it in address 80. 32 byte address 80, and there's the one there. So it's uh, big endian. 
And then we're going to load the call data uh, to see how much is supposed to be being transferred. Um, we're going to load what's in memory, and we're going to compare them. OK, easy enough. We compare, and we find, yeah, it's all fine. So now we're going to load um, that back in and subtract it, because we've now decided that it's, uh, it's got enough uh, data coming in. The guy, I've got enough balance to be transferring that, so it's a valid, trans it's a valid um, operation within this contract. I'm going to subtract it, work out how much I've got left, and store it. And there you go. That's my address. My account balance has just gone down. And then we're going to do the same to, um, to the, the, the guy that it's going to, which is my other account. And we go through it and store it. And then bang, um, I've got um, that amount in my account. Now. OX42 with a bunch of zeros. And then stop. OK, so we're happy that works. Let's execute it. And we can see this transaction. Uh, oh, OK, I'm going to have to mine it. Let's mine it. So mining in Ethereum is very similar to Bitcoin. You're looking for a, um, a small um, result as, uh, from the calculation of combining a, um, two known pieces of information in a cryptographic hash. Uh, one of which is the nonce, and therefore is uh, freely interchangeable. And you're looking for a nonce that gives the result that is uh, sufficiently small. Um, what I've done slightly differently is I've got a, a little graph of it, so you can see uh, how it's doing. Uh, and it's had uh, so this is the maximum it's yet yet reached, and this is the this is what you're after. This red line. As soon as it crosses the red line, it's mined the block. And so this is this is the. Um, uh, what it's getting after about, I don't know, about a thousand or, or ten thousand or so or so um, attempts, so it goes up and down. It's a funny distribution actually. It's like the max, because it, it, it's only looking at the maximum of, of each of these ten thousand attempts. Um, you end up with this funny sort of log normal distribution. But, uh, I've asked a few mathematicians; they don't seem to know precisely what distribution it is. They just say as soon as you apply the max function to a set of values, it, it just yeah, all bets are off. Does anyone, anyone, any mathematicians here care to shed any light? No? The, the distribution from a max of um, randomly chosen numbers? No? Okay. Um, okay, well, while that. Oh, look, we were so close there as well. Like, oh, it's like a pixel off. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we've mined a block. And let's have a look at it in our, our brand new block in the blockchain. So there's two transactions. The first one created this, this new contract, uh, our currency contract. And it gave me oodles of cash. And I also had to pay the miner to mine it. And then this second one, this is, the, this is the, uh, our uh, interaction with that contract. There's our data. It's 232-bit words. Uh, sorry, 232-byte words. Um, the address to whom we want to give some money and the amount of money we want to give. There's the 42 with a bunch of zeros. And it uh, altered my account by reducing it by um, some amount. Uh, 42 minus uh, this original oodles of cash minus 42 with a bunch of zeros is OXFB 0000. And then it, it added my new um, accounts balance to there, which was initialized at the amount that uh, I was given. And that's it. If we look at the um, state of that contract now, we find that it's in the new state. There's mine with slightly less, still oodles of cash, but slightly less oodles than I had before. And, uh, and there's, the, there's someone else's. There's my other account with a bit of money in. OK, so that's a super duper simple contract but it should serve to um, instruct in how it can be done. So let me go back to the talk. Oh, where is it? Yeah, good. OK. OK, so one of the most important things about a system like Ethereum is the ability for contracts to talk to each other, to call into each other and provide services for each other. Um, because it all happens in a um, 
fully deterministic environment. Um, oh, okay. Uh, it's uh, uh, the services that can be provided are. Um, it's kind of like you're, you're able to trust everybody that you can talk to. It's really, really kind of nice environment. This would. Uh, this is an example of calling into a, a name registration contract and trying to register one's name. So, in this case, we 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 give the address here, the registrar. We put the two, uh, we store in memory the two operands, register and our name, and then we call into it with the uh, passing the address in memory and the amount of, of operation, uh, the amount of bytes we want to give to it. 64 is two 32 byte words in this case. Um, I've only got five minutes, so I'm probably not going to go through a walkthrough of the decentralized currency exchange. Um, it's a relatively large amount of code, um, but uh, suffice to say, it's, uh, I coded it up in like three or four hours, and you know it's a fully fledged decentralized exchange. So, you know, stuff that in other ways is taken a very long time to do. When you've got a platform like this, you can do very, very, very easily. Um, thank you. We're looking for devs, um, especially if you wanna, if you know C++ and you wanna, you wanna live in Berlin, then we're definitely interested. Um, are there any questions? Yo. Hi. Uh, since everything is stored on the blockchain and contracts have to have an explicit suicide, uh, is there a kind of DDoS scenario there? And that kind of springs to mind. Uh, so if you mean um, what's stopping me from spamming uh, the blockchain? There's, of course, the proof of work that is, well, stopping you in that sense. But uh, what if the blockchain grows to an unwieldy size like in say, 10 years or five years or whatever? Um, so, it, it, you know, it, for sure it's going to grow, and scalability is always a big, a big, big issue. Um, for 1.0, we're kind of, so we're going to basically plan is to release two versions of it. The 1.0, which is sort of just good enough to get, give people a real taste and be able to work with it. Uh, but inevitably, there are going to be, um, basically, things are going to cost a lot, especially, as you say, as the chain grows. Um, for 2.0, we'll, we've got a few ideas of how to address this. So one of the ideas is like um, effectively re, uh, redoing Genesis blocks every, say, 50,000, 100,000 blocks. So you recast the Genesis. People just download the zip of the Genesis, of uh, the state, and go on from there. So then there's no need to download you know, x billion uh, transactions yeah. worth of blocks. Um, there's also a notion that perhaps we can um, attach a time fee for contracts, so basically contracts have to continue, have to keep their balance topped up. If they don't, and then pay every say 10,000 blocks. If they don't, then they get dropped from the from the state automatically. So sort of automatic suicide. Um, yeah, there's a few ideas going around, uh, which definitely. Yeah, I, I figured it must figure as much. <laughs> cool. Good question. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, can you maybe recommend some related reading about the technical background of this technology? Like, where does this come from? Other than Bitcoin, of course. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, it's worth looking at Nick Sabo's stuff. Uh, he sort of came up with the idea of computers um, as, con you know, evaluating and executing contracts. Um, but if you want, like, more technical reading. You yeah. can read, if you look at the yellow paper, so there's, I wrote a paper about this. This is basically the formal specification of Ethereum. Um, the references there might provide you with some decent links. But to be honest, it, it's kind of odd. I mean, if you ignore hash cash, um, there's not much before Bitcoin that um, explored this area. I, th I think in many respects, it, it's, you know, I presented this um, to my old university, right, to my old department, and it, it was incredible how, you know, it's like, yeah, that's just a virtual, you know, we, we know about computers, we, you know, we know, we know instruction sets, what are you talking about? There was the notion that it's, you know, a decentralized singleton computing resource seems to have completely passed them by, they, they don't understand. So, um, I suppose in response to your question, there's, there's not that much to go off. We're, we're really kind of winging it <laughs> to some degree. Um, but 
Yeah, look at the references for the yellow paper and Nick Sabo. That's, I think, the best I can do. Thanks. That's OK. Uh, any other questions? No? Hello. Uh, I'm, I had a um, presentation about crypto radio before you, and uh, I was wondering about uh, um, broadcasting these um, Ethereum transactions and uh, other data um, using crypto radio. Do you see any benefits from doing that? And I'm always interested to cooperating with you to get it going if you want. Yeah, no, um, I thought it was a very interesting talk, actually. Um, at the moment, of course, uh, you know, if I go to a bar and I want to, um, well, maybe not a bar, but if, I'm, if I want to receive a transaction, the only thing I, I have to have internet on my phone to be guaranteed that uh, they're not sort of, you know, just <laughs> walking through a, a fake Bitcoin client and, oh, yeah, look, the transaction has gone through. It's like, really? I don't know. Whereas, of course, if it's broadcast on radio, and because it's a singleton, you can actually do this. It's much better than broadcasting in many other uh, uh, things of the internet where it's necessarily peer-to-peer. Uh, blockchain technology is necessarily singleton technology, which allows me, when I want to do a, a transaction with someone, and when I want to be guaranteed I've received the funds, it's great. You know, I, I, I have a, a radio receiver, and I can um, I can check that that is indeed there. Uh, this would be particularly good for a lot of hardware. For instance, suppose you have a, an automatically uh, locking car. So um, what it needs to do is listen on the blockchain for a transaction. Uh, or this, well, actually, it would probably be a change in its own state uh, of, of a contract that models its state, I should say. And whenever that contract state says, you know, whenever it's a particular address goes to a zero, that means unlock the lock. So it never needs to actually push anything onto the blockchain. It just needs to read the current state of the blockchain. Um, now, having to have a Wi-Fi you know, or an internet connection, you know, for, for that car lock is a bit crazy, you know, do you really want to have to pay for a mobile phone subscription so that a car lock can listen to a singleton data resource? No, you don't. Um, but installing a radio receiver, well, you know, that's comparatively easy and, and, and it comes with no subscription model and it's relatively, uh, relatively cheap. So, yeah, uh, I think when uh, blockchain starts getting interface to hardware, then we'll really see projects like yours, uh, you know, sort of fall into a world of their own. Yeah. Uh, I noticed from the website that you have collected with crowdfunding 10,000 Bitcoin, so it's quite a lot of money. Okay. So do you want to tell us what kind of organization do you have and how do we plan to use that money and so on? Uh, okay, I'll, uh, yeah. So it's, there's a non-profit organization in Switzerland that will um, oversee spending of the funds. The way the funds will be spent is after the initial um, portion of uh, expenses we've accrued uh, so far was paid off. Um, the first six million dollars worth, which is whatever ten thousand, I guess it's about what we've got, what we've collected, will go to um, a pure development outfit. So it's run by three people: either me, um, C++ guy. Uh, Jeff, who did the Go client, and Vitalik, who came up with the original white paper and has been working on the Python client. So we three will administer those uh, that funds in order to do the rest of the technology. So after that point, so after we after we've got our six million and the debts have been repaid, then it basically goes to this organisation and they get to give the money out. But with the uh, with the idea that. Um, 12 more million will be, uh, if we, we raise that much, which we probably won't, but um, if we get another 12 million, then that will go to version two and the, the additional stuff that we were talking about earlier. So, you know, recasting Genesis blocks and uh, maybe some of the other cool scalability stuff that we're working on. Okay, thank you.